In terms of our uh, packet of silver bullets, in terms of oil and gas, we now know there's not enough resources. The coal, the tar sands, and the oil shale will just simply destroy the environment. Uh, the nuclear fission, there's not enough uranium and fusion is uh, too far away or too difficult. Biomass is poisoning the air, the water, and the soil. Hydroelectric is useful, but we've run out of sites, and there's been a price that we've paid for damming the rivers. Our hydrogen folly, we uh, took all of us about 10 or 20 years to finally understand it takes more energy to make hydrogen than it produces. We're now into uh, a big push on photovoltaic and wind power, which is very expensive but also vital. These are proven technologies. They're growing at the rate of about 40% per year. But David Pimentel pointed out in a seminal work a few years ago that we might get 30 to 40% of our energy covered with uh, PVs and wind. And there's all kinds of limitations on those, that, but mainly because they're, they're intermittent. I basically support the development of those as fast as possible, but don't consider it's going to keep me uh, from changing my lifestyle. So I kind of summarize uh, uh, four uh, technology and societal options. Uh, a and B, and I'm, unfortunately this also fits up with the, the tracks, and there's just no relation to it at all. Uh, plan A is, is the, uh, the black plan of more, more uh, kinds of fossil fuels and a movement to coal. Uh, plan B is the green, the wind, solar, and the corn technology. Um, unfortunately, most of our major nonprofit groups, like the Sierra Club and the Environmental Defense Fund, the National Resource Council have really made a strong commitment to the statement of you can go with green technology and you don't have to change your way of living. Uh, some of these organizations have teamed up with major corporations now to make this sort of a, a joint nonprofit and corporate effort and I think this this is going to have disastrous consequences because the the nonprofits really have compromised their position uh, to to help the, the corporates who want to keep business as usual going as much as possible. So I think that uh, this, is, this is a problem, and I don't think green energy is the solution for what's facing us. Plan C is the name of my book and what we talk about. Um, if you notice that, we've got a, a, a less is more t-shirt because what we're talking about is less consumption. It means more happiness, that less fossil fuel consumption means more chances of survival. And fundamentally, uh, I view there, there's been a disease of consumerism that took us over uh, after the Second World War, and that's been our problem, and what we've obtained from it uh, has been very little. Uh, fancy cars and a large house, but an environment that won't support life. Plan D is the uh, familiar die-off uh, solution, and I'm not, I have an optimistic viewpoint of things, although people that are talking about this are concerned, and they have some right to be concerned, and we just can't write them off as doomsayers. So I want to talk about Plan C, and I want to introduce the, the curtailment principle. I've talked a lot about the language that we've been using, like... Um, sustainability and green and conservation. And Richard Heinberg talked about language in his uh, presentation yesterday, that the language and the words we select are very, very important. And I selected the word curtailment because I know personally in my life I'm cutting back my energy consumption. All my staff at Community Solutions is doing that. And our view is we have to reduce what we're consuming in order to, for the planet to survive. And so we do that. Thank you. And the cuts have to be deep. The IPCC says we need to reduce 80 to 90 percent by 2050, and that's 4 percent yearly. So that's the level that we've got to start operating is how can I can cut 4 percent every year. Our focus and my, my combination, I'm, I'm an engineer by background, and so I'll uh, but I'm a communitarian engineer. Uh, we were told yesterday about Arthur Morgan, who's the founder of our organization, who was a great uh, uh, dam builder and formed many, many communities, both intentional communities and, and changed uh, small local communities. But I'm going to be talking a lot about some very practical aspects of how are you going to curtail energy. 
And the first thing I'm going to point out is most of the energy, two-thirds of the energy, is under your personal control in terms of your house and the foods and the car you drive. So you don't need to worry too much about the airplanes and the shipping and what's happening with the large commercial buildings. You can control two-thirds of the energy um, because that's what you're actually spending your money for. And by your purchases, you can also control the other one-third of the energy. If you decide, or if we all decide, for example, that we can't continue to fly, then that will be the end of the air, airplane industry. And finally, we need to take responsibility. We need to be the change that we want to see in the world, uh, as Gandhi pointed out and as some of the other speakers have said. And so the change begins with me and my personal choices. And that's what we uh, focus on in our organization. Now, being an engineer, I want to talk about the way I approach a problem. There's a lot of people that are looking at this as a, a huge issue. Most engineers look at it and they may lament it, but then they start figuring out, well, how can I fix this? What changes can I make? And what designs can I suggest? And so one of the ways I start is to look at the whole problem. In other words, look at the global issue. Uh, you first you think global and also you think local and then you act local. And we have to start looking at and understand something on a per capita basis. Uh, when we compare countries, that's always misleading because of the population differences. And the media constantly obscures per capita so we can feel righteous. So right now, the great enemy facing us is China, who in two years as a nation will generate as much CO2 as we generate. But of course, there's five times as many, four times as many people. Um, and you have to look at this per capita uh, in the area of CO2 generation in, ton, in terms of tons per capita per year, the energy consumption, and I use barrels of uh, oil equivalent per year, which is a common measure. And by the way, I avoid the carbon footprint because I can't think in terms of acres of usage, whether I use three or four acres. But I really am clear how much oil and natural gas and coal I'm using when I, by looking at my electrical bills. And then we need to look at the income uh, per capita per year. In my book, uh, I point out that, um, in fact, let me show the next curve here. This is a CO2 of, of the major nations. And I have charts in my book that show the CO2, the um, energy consumption in terms of barrel of oil equivalent, and the income, and show that all those curves look very, very similar. French is, France is a little obscure because they use so much nuclear energy, which says really your income, the CO2 you generate, and the oil you consume, and coal and natural gas are all one and the same things. If you're living well, if you have a high income, you're probably generating lots of CO2. If we look at this chart, um, at the top we have the United States, which is generating 19.6 tons of CO2 per capita. And then we move down through Russia, Germany, and all of these you'll see are the European nations. And, and when you come down to, oh, about midway down, you see China, which is about 3.8. So the difference between the, the Chinese today, let's say roughly four, and us roughly 20, is today five to one. A few years ago, it would have been 10 to one. Now the current world average, uh, looking here at the, the left bottom, is approximately four tons per person. So that's how much CO2 the 6.7 billion people are generating for each one of them. But a sustainable level is about one ton per person. And this comes from the IPCC uh, analysis, which has been uh, looked at considerably, is this is what our target has to be if we want to be sustainable, or as I say it, uh, to survive. And th by the way, this is the 33 of the most populous nations, 80% of the world population. The US is the greatest contributor of CO2, uh, both today and in the past. This, this country has contributed 27% of the CO2, and therefore we need a 90% reduction. So from, from my perspective, I look at the situation, uh, I accept the scientific information about climate, uh, and also I realize that from the other side there's a forcing function of there's not going to be enough fuels to generate this level of CO2, so whether I want to save the planet or whether I want to deal with 